Welcome everyone to Pathways to the Orchard. Tonight is Parshat Emor. This week is Parshat Emor. And Emor is somewhat neatly divided between the beginning, which is almost exclusively about the Kohanim, different laws about uh, the Kohanim. And it begins actually with uh, what does a coin do at the, at the time of a close relative uh, passes away? And then it continues into different aspects of the life of the Kohen and the service of the Kohen. And then the second part of the Parsha, a, a good half of it is goes to all of the holidays. All of the holidays are reviewed and each time they're reviewed, different aspects are brought out. As we will see later in this week's parsha, is the, the main uh, idea of Sphira to Omer, is in this week's Torah portion. And then it ends with something also that we'll, we'll get to with an incident of someone who unfortunately curses God. And the whole story of what, what happens with them. So there's really like three different parts, and we will be dealing somewhat with, with all of them. So we're going to start with, there's a certain, you can almost say, theme that runs through this Torah portion. And that is there's a constant repetition of the idea of sanctifying God's name and profaning God's name. The root words here are Kodesh and Chol. This is part of Havdalah. When we make Havdalah Saturday night and we make a separation, Bain Kodesh Lechol, between the holy and the, we'll call it the mundane. When it's uh, in a more negative sense, it means to profane. And this theme runs through it. There are many, many different verses. I'm just going to read a couple of them. But we'll see th these two words come up over and over again. The idea of sanctifying God's name and the idea of profaning God's name. So the first is in chapter 21, verse 6. It says, Kedoshim yu le'eloheihem. Here it's talking to the Kohanim. They shall be holy to their God. Velo yechalalu shem eloheihem. And they should not profane the name of their God. Ki et ishe Hashem lechem Eloheihem hem makrivim vayu kodesh, because they are bringing the the offerings of God, the the bread of God, meaning the offerings, they are bringing, and that is what. And, and therefore, they must remain in a state of holiness. Many of these laws that are talked about in Parashat Emor is how does a Kohen keep to a state of holiness and not to profane his holiness during the service? So that's one example. Another example is says, this is chapter 22, the second verse. Taber el Aharon ve'al banav ve'yinazru mikodshe b'nei Yisrael v'lo yichalalu et shem kodshi asher hem mikodshim li ani Hashem. So it says, speak to the children of Aaron. Speak to Aaron and his children. And they shall um, 
they should exercise separation and they should not profane my holy name, that they are, they become holy through their service because they are sanctified to me. I am God. So again, this idea of sanctifying God's name or profaning God's name. So in simple, what this means is, is, is if a Kohen or a regular person, when we follow the Torah, we observe the mitzvot, and the, the Gemara uh, makes clear, and I write about this in Fruits of the Orchard, that we'll just call it simply being a good person in the world is considered sanctifying God's name. When a person acts incorrectly, uh, engages in all kinds of uh, illicit acts, then that is called profaning God's name. This is all based on the idea that we are, we're all like Kohanim. This Parsha is directly addressing the Kohanim. But right before we receive the Torah, so God says that you will be a holy nation and a nation of priests. And we're not all priests. We're not all Kohanim. But what it means is that in relationship to the world, just like the Kohen administers and does the service for all of Israel, in a sense, Israel, in relationship to the world, are the koanim of the world, the spiritual leaders of the world. That is what we're meant to be. And so as a messenger, as a representative, when we do what we're supposed to do, and especially when we act morally and ethically and kindly, then we are sanctifying God's name because we represent God in the world. And so when people look upon us and they see that we are a good example of moral, ethical, holy, spiritual people, then it reflects good on God. And the opposite, when we do all kinds of things that we should not be doing, then this in a sense, is a pro, uh, it profanes God's name. Then later, one of the most important ideas that has to do with the idea of sanctifying God's name. So here it's in chapter 22, verse 32. 22, 32. And it says, the low this is talking to all of the people, not just to Kohanim. It says, Do not profane my holy name. And I will be sanctified through the children of Israel. Ani Hashem Mikadishchem. I am God who makes you holy. Now, we have to remember that Parshat Emor follows Parshat Kedoshim. Last week's Parsha, and we discussed this, is Kedoshim to you. God directs us, commands us that you shall be holy because I, your God, am holy. And so this Parsha is following the, the whole concept of being holy. And we discussed that the actual definition in the most technical way of holiness comes through separation. When we separate ourselves from those things that we shouldn't be doing or influences that are not good for us, 
then we could uh, attain a state called holiness. An example of this is Shabbat. We call Shabbat Shabbat Kodesh. The Hasidic rabbis, when they would eat the meals on Shabbat, before they would put a bite in their mouth, they would say, Le covered Shabbos Kodesh, for the honor of the holy Shabbat. So the whole idea of Shabbat is, we call it Shabbos Kodesh, the, the holiness of Shabbat. Well, how do we get to the holiness of Shabbat? And the way we get there is by separating ourselves, refraining from doing all of the forbidden acts on Shabbat. By not doing the 39, what are called Av Malachas, the major categories of law that we don't engage in in Shabbat, by separating ourselves, removing ourselves from all of these kinds of actions, we open the way to experience holiness. It's through separation. Rashi, in the beginning of Parsha Kedoshim, says anywhere you have a fence against illicit sexual relations and sin in general, there you will find holiness. In other words, Sometimes we think of a holy person as a spiritual person. And that's that's true, but that doesn't tell us much. What is holiness? If you just say it, it, it's, it, it's spiritual, well, that can mean a lot of things. And so the idea of separating ourselves from uh, lust, and desire, and forbidden acts, and unethical acts, and immoral acts. All of this helps build towards a state of holiness. And yet all the commentaries say that there's two stages of holiness. The Ramchal, uh, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, in his famous book, uh, the Mesilot um, Yesharim, the Pathways of the Just, explains that uh, very clearly that we have to work very, very, very hard to reach a level of holiness. But ultimately, holiness is a gift. And that's why in most cases, it talks about God's holy name. Is we can reach holiness because God is holy. And since the soul is an actual part of God above, the divine soul, that is how we can reach holiness. But ultimately, it's, it's, it's a gift. Just like, in a sense, a person can keep all the laws of Shabbat and have absolutely no joy in Shabbat. Ultimately, the, the holiness of Shabbat is, is, is a gift. It is a gift. So all of this is an introduction to, and I, I didn't even read all of the verses that mention the idea of sanctifying God's name and profaning God's name. The last one I read, when I said, which I said was, was very important because this is the source of the concept of, in certain cases, it should never happen to anyone, where we are called upon to sacrifice our lives for God. That's how Rashi explains it. When it says, V'niktashti b'tocham, and I will be sanctified among the children of Israel. So Rashi explains that this means, this is the, the commandment that when necessary, that a person should be ready to sacrifice their life uh, if, if, if called upon to do so. This is very significant because we're talking 
a few hours before the beginning of Yom Zikaron, Israel Memorial Day, where for the last 76 years, we are here in Israel because there were, were those tens of thousands now who are willing to sacrifice their life to defend our right to be in Eretz Yisrael. It was their, their sacrifice and their really their fulfillment of the nikdashti betoch b'nei Yisrael that they were willing to uh, defend the country even at the price of their lives. And uh, unfortunately, we're seeing it today virtually every single day. Uh, very, very heartbreaking when you read the, the ages of the soldiers who are, who are dying now, trying to defend Israel. Uh, this, this idea is very, very, very relevant. So what I want to do now, though, is it's something we've done before, and we're going to delve into the what we'll call the holiness of the Hebrew language, because there uh, there is a lot of secrets in the letters making up the the various words that we're talking about kadosh and chilul. Chilul. We're going to start with chilul again. Means to profane. Chet lamed lamed. So. What this word means, we're translating it as profane. In a lighter sense, it can mean mundane, which is, which is not a, a, a negative thing. But when we separate uh, Motzi Shabbos, Saturday night, between Shabbat and the six days of work, we're, we're, we're havdel ben kodesh lechol. Chol is the same root as halal, chilul. It's the same root, chet lamed, or chet lamed lamed. So there it just means ordinary, the six ordinary days of the week. There's nothing negative about it. It's just not the holiness of Shabbat or one of the holidays. And so halal actually means empty. Outer space in modern Hebrew is called the halal. Outer space. Now, we know that outer space is not empty, but conceptually, when we think of the vast uh, distances, when we talk about light years away from a galaxy, we're talking about phenomenally large numbers here. And so we think of outer space as being somewhat empty. A vacuum is called a halal, something that is empty. So here, we're, we're just analyzing these words to try to get a, a deeper appreciation. So in other words, when we said before that chilul means to profane, we could understand it as a, an absence of God's presence. That if we're not doing correct, if we're doing illegal, immoral, uh, uh, unethical, it's as if there's an absence of God's presence there. Now, ultimately, there is, it's almost oxymoronic to say that anything can be totally empty of God's presence. But in general, we could talk about when there is an absence of, of holiness or goodness or godliness. And so here, halal, that is the, the, the profaning God's name is, in a sense, taking a situation and emptying it of holiness. And that's why it's the opposite of kadosh, of holy. Holy means uh, uh, full of the presence of God, brimming with the 
the energy and the light of God. Whereas profaning God's name means emptying the situation, emptying the experience from, from godliness. Now, in Hebrew, interestingly enough, many, many words have opposite meanings, or they can, they can have opposite meanings. That a root word, let's say, in general, has a negative connotation. But at the same time, it might also be used in certain contexts in, in a totally positive way. And this happens with many words. So in the, in the Psalms, so David Amelach says, Libi chalal bekirbi. My heart is empty within me. But here he, he really means the opposite. He doesn't mean my heart is empty of godliness, of holiness. He's actually saying the opposite. My heart is empty of anything that would take me away from God. So here in this sense, the halal is the space where goodness can happen. That's what Davi means. Libi halal bekirbi. And because it's empty, there is a place to fill it with holiness. So here we see halal used in the opposite sense. Usually, as I said, we, we, we talk about it being profane. Now, a corpse is called a halal, is also the soul has left the body and it now becomes empty of the soul. It's only the, the physical body that remains. That is what is buried. And so that's a very appropriate name. The, 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 it's, it's soulless. And so it's called a halal. And yet, this, the, and also in, in Hebrew, the chet lamed is the basis of sickness. Someone who is sick is called a chole, chet lamed. Someone who is weak is called chalash, chet lamed shin here. So in all these cases, it means weakness, sickness, and when it goes to its extreme, another lamed is added and, and, and the person becomes a halal. He becomes a corpse. But here we're going to have the opposite meaning of chet lamed, that strength in Hebrew is called chayal. A woman of valor. We sing this song every Friday night. Eshet chayal means a woman of valor, a, a, a beautiful description, very positive. A soldier is in modern Hebrew is called a chayal. So here the same root can mean chalash, weak or strong, depending on how it's used. So here we have this idea that we're, we're uh, corresponding Kodesh to Chol. And here we see that Chol means the opposite of Kodesh. But now let's look at the word Kodesh. Almost uh, uh, strangely, in the Torah, a prostitute is called the Kadesha, the exact same root as Kadosh. But here again, just like we learned, David Amelech says, Libi chalal bekirbi, my heart is empty within me. But here the emptiness is a positive emptiness that can now be filled with holiness. And so a prostitute is the same root as holy, but here it means exactly the opposite. 
she becomes a representative uh, of the exact opposite. And the, the Torah actually talks about a, a male prostitute also. And it's, a, it's the, same, the same idea. So you can have both, both meanings. So here we can see something that in a certain sense, there's a very, very fine line sometimes between holy and profane. In other words, it's, one has to be very, very careful their whole life. We really can't rest on our laurels because the, 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 the slippery slope sometimes between holy and unholy, permitted and not permitted, legal and illegal, uh, sometimes is, is a very, very fine, fine line. So now we're going to jump to the end of the Parsha because I told you that there was an incident at the end of the Parsha where someone curses God's name. And there's a, there's, there's a whole story to it. And that is that we're told that this person came from a Jewish mother, but a non-Jewish father. And we're told by tradition that this is the incident, if you remember, when Moshe kills the Egyptian who was beating a Jew. So the Midrash tells us, what, what's the story here? What, what, what's going on? So the Midrash tells us that this Egyptian uh, had his eyes on the wife of the Jewish man that he was beating. And one night in the middle of the night, remember, these are the, the, the taskmasters. They think they rule the world. He slipped into um, her bed and had relations with her, and she didn't even know what was happening, really. It was dark. And her husband found out, and that's why the Egyptian was beating him. He didn't want to be found out. And so we're told that from that one night, Leazan, that she, she, she didn't ask for it or want it. She didn't even know. A, a, a boy was born when they were out in the desert and they were assigning uh, uh, places for everyone to be, it became a problem because the, uh, the camp that one was assigned to was according to the father. And we're told that this was the only incident in Egypt of a Jewish woman um, having been with a non-Jewish man and giving birth. And so he, he didn't know where he belonged because he, he didn't have, he didn't have an, like an inheritance. He didn't have a place in the camp. And because of this whole thing, he came to curse God. And so in the Torah, he's called the Mikalel the one who curses. And here, the letters are kuf lamed lamed. Now, this is obviously very close to chet lamed lamed. And the kuf and the, and the chet are also very close to each other in, in sound and can be exchanged. So, the fact that this incident is in the Parsha that talks uh, repeatedly of the idea of profaning God's name. Well, here, the one who curses does just that. He profanes God's name. He curses God's name. Chas v'shalom. Chas v'shalom. So here, again, I started this by trying to show through the Hebrew letters, how different meanings and nuances 
are, are found in the different stories and the different mitzvahs of the Torah and the wording of the Torah. So here, if we look at the, the root of to curse, kalel, it equals 160. 160 equals the word selim, which can mean two opposite things. In the Torah, making an idol is sometimes called making a selim. We're making an image we're trying to make an image of God from some physical uh, approximation. That's called making a, an idol, is we imagine that this form uh, expresses or has a certain godly power. But that same word, selim, is used in that God created human beings, but selim elokim in the image of God. So here we see that the, the gematria of kalel to curse can mean both, both sides. It could be an image of idol worship or an actual image of God. So this, this is alerting us to the what we call the fine points of life. The, um, the gray areas, the fine lines between uh, just about everything, how, uh, how one has to be so careful. And it says in Pirkei Avot that you can't sleep on the job. Someone can live a whole life of holiness and towards the end, Totally blow it. Totally blow it. We see this with Shlomo Amelech. Shlomo Amelech, King Solomon, was considered the, the wisest of all people. He builds the temple. There's peace in the land. People from all over the world come to learn wisdom from Shlomo. But the Book of Kings makes it very clear at the end of his life, he, he fell. He, he, he didn't hold on to that level that he had reached. And that's just, just an example. So here in the book of Ezekiel, that uh, this word, kuf lamed lamed, is actually used once to mean like shining, illumination, light, so here it's like the opposite of its usual meaning. So again, this, this whole teaching tonight is looking through the Hebrew letters and the words to show that depending on the perspective, depending on the context, uh, not just words can mean different things, but situations can take on very, very different meanings depending on how we're approaching them or how we, uh, we broadcast our, our, ourself. So now I want to take it one more step, going back to the word kadosh, kuf dalad shin. So this is here between kadosh and halal, we saw that the kuf and the chet are, are, are very, very close between kalel and, and halal. But when we're talking about kadosh, so there's another word that is very, very similar also with the kuf and a chet, is chadash. Kadosh is kuf dalad shin, to make new, something innovative is called chadash, is chet dalad shin. So the last two letters of holy 
and newness are the same. Dalit and Shin. It's the first letters that change. So it's telling us that there's something very, very connected to holiness and to what's called having a chidush, having an innovative idea. So that opens us up to the holiness of the Torah. When we see something new in the Torah, we have a new insight, new revelation. So that's opening up ourselves to experience the holiness of the Torah and the holiness of God shining through the Torah. So it's a beautiful idea of Chadash and Kodesh. Is they're, they're very, very similar. So here in the end, I came up with kind of like a, a flow that we could follow here. So it's something like this, that when a person can, like David and Melech, empty their heart of ego, empty their mind of ego, and reach a selfless kind of place, empty, like a halal, that's empty, but in a positive way. So that empty place can become the receptacle for something chadash, from something new. And when we experience something new, that uh, uh, it causes an arousal of holiness, kodesh, that can produce a shining light, kalal. So these are, I'm going to say that again, <laughs> so I, I don't lose everyone here. We're taking all the words that we've talked about, halal, which can mean empty in the positive sense or a negative sense, kadosh, which means holy, but it's very, very close to chadash, something new. And we've talked about uh, cursing God's name, chas v'shalom, and that the same word can mean light or illumination. So I have to mention that the, uh, the word for to, to curse, that can also mean to illuminate, is very close to the word halal. It has two lamans at the end. Instead of kalel, it's halel. Halel means to praise. That's the name of the special prayer that we say on holidays. That we we sing and it's 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 so joyful. And there are two lamids there. And so here it's taking the the, the lamids, and actually halel, the word halo is said to come from Hallel. And in the Torah, halo means light. It means light. So I'm going to say this again, that when we can empty a place within our soul, within our mind, within our heart, and empty it of ego and extraneous static, kind of like a meditative state. So then we're open to experience something new. And when we experience something new, that gets us in touch with holiness. We could even turn it around that through feeling this empty place, then we have a place for holiness to come in. When we feel holiness, then we're inspired to see new insight, new experience. And that new experience is experienced as light. It's like the light bulb going off you know, in, the, in the comic strips. When someone has a new idea, 
it's always the light bulb going off in the brain. Actually, I write about this in in, the, in my book about light, that that is, is actually a very, very good metaphor because we now know that the brain is an, an electric um, uh, uh, fuse box. It's, it's all electric um, synapses. So when the, when the light bulb goes off, it's quite literal that there's an electric impulse that's shooting between synapses that is helping to create the new idea. And at the end, it's experienced as kalel, halel, as light. Okay, that was the first insight of the night. L'chaim, everyone, l'chaim. Now, the next one is, it's actually very, very connected. And I already mentioned that the second half of the Parsha, the Torah goes through all of the holidays. And the one that it goes through in great detail, and it's the only place in the Torah that mentions this in, in, in such detail, is Sfira to Omer, the period that we're in right now. And it it, it, it talks about the seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuos and the idea of counting the days and seven complete weeks. Everything we know about Sefirot to Omer is in, excuse me, in this Parsha. So there's a, a, a Torah from the Beit Avram of Slonim that is brought down in the Tibot Shalom. And in the Torah, and when we count Omer, before we count the Omer, and afterwards, in, in every Siddur, there, there's a short paragraph. The, the beginning is, it, is to prepare ourselves to say the blessing and count the day. And the paragraph after is the intention of how we should use this day, especially the combination of svirot that are appropriate for the day. And so in the Torah, it says that we should count sheva shabbatot t'mimot t'yena, seven complete weeks. And that this is why the, uh, the, the custom is, even though you have all night to count Omer, but the custom is, is to count it as soon as you can in the evening in order that the seven weeks should be complete. In other words, that you count at the beginning of each day. We know the day begins in the, in the evening. Vahi era, vahi voker. It was evening and it was morning and each day of creation. And so it says you shall count seven complete weeks. So the Beit Avram of Slonim said an interesting thing. We all know that this is one of the longest mitzvot in the Torah. It takes 49 days to actually do this one mitzvah. You have to count all 49 days. And so it's, it's not always easy to keep our eyes on the ball. Many people have experienced that they forgot one night and then the next day, you know, if you forget to count at night, you're allowed to count the next day without a blessing. And then you can continue saying the blessing. But many people, because of life, life, life gets in the way. We miss a night, we miss a day, and we can't, we can't complete the, the mitzvah with the, with the blessing. So the Beit Avram says, when it says you should count seven complete weeks, he said, at least make your Shabbos complete. As it says, Sheva Shabbatot Tamimotiena, seven whole, literally, Shabbos. Here, Shabbos means a week. Sheva Shabbatot Tamimotiena means seven complete weeks. But it's the same word as seven 
full Shabbos. So he said, even if you count Omer, that you should have special intent that the seven Shabbos of this period should be whole, complete, full. So that in itself is just a beautiful, just a beautiful word. It's almost like a play on words. So since we began the discussion tonight talking about the the uh, relationship between holy and profane, or holy and mundane, kodesh and chol. So when we read the intent before and after uh, Sfira to Omer, which again is in this week's Parsha. So, just one second. Here, I'm actually just going to read from the paragraph afterwards. The paragraph after emphasized, just like our Parsha, over and over again, returns to this theme of sanctifying God's name or profaning God's name. And as we said, just in general, it means when, you, when we do what we're supposed to do, then we're sanctifying God's name. And when we're not doing what we're supposed to do, we could be, God forbid, profaning God's name. So, and especially publicly, especially publicly. And so afterwards, there two words come up over and over again, Kedusha and Tahara, holiness and purity. So I'm just going to read some of it. I'm not going to read the whole, the whole thing. So it says, it begins like this, Rabboni Sha'olam. Master of the world, you have commanded us through Moshe, your servant, to count the days of the Omer in order to purify ourselves from all extraneous uh, influences. And then it says later, It says, uh, on, on the merit of us counting the Omer today, it's, and then it says, I should be able to fix that which I may have blemished in the sphera of, and then we fill in the sphera. And then it says, the et taher, the et kadesh, and I will become pure, and I will become holy. The kedusha shamala, in the holiness of above. And through this, Yushpa Shefarav, there should be a influx of positive energy. In Bakala Olamot, in all of the worlds, that we should be able to fix our nefesh, our ruach, and our neshama, three levels of the soul. Nikal Sigupagam from Every type of blemish. Ula taharenu, ula kadshenu, bikadushatcha el yona. That we should be able to purify ourselves and make ourselves holy in your uh, exalted holiness. So here we see two words come up again and again tahara and kadusha, purity and holiness. So in the Svirot, in Kabbalah, holiness is always associated with Chachma, with wisdom, and Tahara is always associated with Bina, with understanding. Chachma is considered a more uh, masculine energy, and Tahara, purity, is considered more of a feminine energy. But it says in the Zohar that Chachma and Bina are tre ra'in de lo itpashtin 
Leolmin. They are two beloveds that never separate. So that's why in many prayers, we'll hear these two words together, Kedusha and Tahara, holiness and purity. So what's interesting is that Bina, Bina is associated with purity. And so therefore, there is, in relating to Chachma, we're told there are 32 pathways of wisdom, and there are 50 gates of understanding. So the 32 pathways of wisdom, this is mentioned uh, in the beginning of Sefer Yitzira, and the 50 gates of understanding are mentioned in the Talmud. But here again, Chachma is associated with wisdom and Bina, understanding with, with purity. So we, uh, in our tradition, we're told that when we were in Egypt, we fell to the 49th level of impurity, of impurity. And this is very connected to, obviously, the 49 days of counting Omer. And so, therefore, we're taught what we're doing every day of counting, other than just today is the first day, today is the second day, today is the third day. Um, as we've discussed, and uh, people obviously can learn about this, Every day of the Omer, we're supposed to be trying to fix our, our whole being, as we said in this intention, nafshotenu, veruchotenu, v'nishmatenu, our nefesh, our ruach, and our neshama. It's called, it's called tikkun amidot. So, um, uh, metaphorically, every day of the Omer, we're exchanging one level of impurity for a level of purity. And so the 40, we, we fell to the 49 gates of impurity, and now we have to climb 49 days by exchanging. Every day we have to make some kind of fixing, some kind of tikkun, some kind of repair or healing or improvement. That is the purpose of Svira to Omer. And so here we can see how holiness and purity come together. It, I mentioned already the Ramchal in his classic work, Mesirat Yesharim, where he, 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 it's based on a Gemara from uh, Pinchas ben Yair, where he sets up a ladder of how to climb up the ladder of spirituality. And there's many, many different levels, the levels of separation, levels of cleanliness, levels of purity, and ultimately, the ultimate one is of holiness. And the one of purity comes before holiness. Now, this is interesting because usually we say Kedusha Vitahara, holiness and purity. But that is, as it were, a, a, a perspective from above to below. In other words, we said before that ultimately holiness is a gift from God. We have to do our work from below, and it's a lot of work. It's a lifetime of work to reach a level of holiness. But ultimately, it's God who grants us the gift of, of holiness. And it's the same thing with Tahara. We have to work very, very hard to purify ourselves. <clears throat> and both of these uh, uh, levels of holiness and purity have to do with separation. It's through separating ourselves from the extraneous, from it, but it doesn't mean totally uh, um, separating ourselves from the physical. But it does mean um, separating ourselves from the, the desires for the physical. 
the passions for the physical uh, and, and being totally attached to the physical. Once we can break our attachment, then the physical world is here for us to use and to enjoy. But we have to break our, our physical attachments in, in such a way that frees us to enjoy them in a spiritual way. So here in Sfirat Omer, when I, when I read, interesting enough, in, in, in the few cases that I read, first is mentioned Tahara, and then Kedusha. The opposite of the way we usually say it. Usually we say it, Kedusha Vitara, holiness and purity. But here, it's actually in the order that the Ramchal says, that first you have to reach a level of purity, and then you can reach a level of holiness. Like we read, the et taher, the et kadesh, big kedusha shomala. I will become purified, and I will become holy in your elevated holiness. And then, and then again, it says at the end, the idea ule taharenu ule kachenu to become purified and to become holy in your holiness. So this is something we mentioned before, the, the idea that when we count the Omer, we count from below to above. One, two, three, four, five, and we get to 49. But when we mention the spherot that we're a, 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 attaching to each day, we begin from above to below. Chesed, Gevura, Teferah, Netzachod, Yesod, Malchut is going from above to below. So here we have this, this, this dual idea of our working from below to above. And as, as we climb the ladder, each step, in a certain way, God responds from above to below. And so it's like, even though we end up like this, but the idea is like we're meeting in the middle. And this is the idea of Kedusha and Tara, holiness and purity, but we're attaining it through purity and getting to holiness. In, in, in the Ramchal, the highest level is, is holiness. And here we can relate to it, to the laws of family purity that when uh, a, a, a woman begins to menstruate, so husband and wife separate, here's, here's where the idea of holiness and purity come through separation. And when she's gone through the process, then she goes to the mikvah and husband and wife are together like wedding night. And so here first she goes to the mikvah the mikvah is always considered the idea of purity, a bina of the woman. And then when husband and wife come back together, this is taking the physical and elevating it to the level of holiness. Here we have one of the most physical of all acts. And yet when raised from below to above, it becomes a, 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 a holy act. So we'll end with a, a blessing that we use the time of Svirat to Omer to do the hard work of fixing ourselves, improving ourselves, healing ourselves, contributing to the world, making the world a better place. And as we do that, we, we pray that God will respond in, 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 in a like manner and will grant all of us the 
purity and the holiness that we so much desire.